Well, let's get started this morning in Sunday School. And our lesson this morning is taken from Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 11 through 19, and then 25 through 26. But the lesson is entitled Warns, W-A-R-N-S, Warns. So if you allow me, I'm going to read the printed text, and we're going to come back and discuss it and see what God has to say. Beginning at Ezekiel 28 with verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sellest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have sent thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of them with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering, cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that beheld thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Thus saith the Lord God, When I shall have gathered the house of Israel from the people among whom they are scattered, and shall be sanctified in them in the sight of the heathen, then shall they dwell in their land that I have given to my servant Jacob. And they shall dwell safely therein, and shall build houses and plant vineyards. Yea, they shall dwell with confidence when I have executed judgments upon all those that despise them round about them. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God. All right, there is a lot of stuff in here. And there's a lot of, you can call it symbolism, mysteries, or whatever. And it's a lot of different descriptions or interpretations that people have given to what's going on here. But I think we can gather a central theme as we go through it as to what the Lord's trying to say to us. So let's go back and look at the first of the verses here, 11 and 12. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me. So basically this word that's coming from Ezekiel came from God. So it's not Ezekiel coming up with these ideas. This is what God wanted said. So, moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, which was a designation that God used of Ezekiel almost a hundred times in the book, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. All right. A lamentation can denote a song of mourning for the dead. Now, that's interesting because he said, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. Well, what's another name for Tyrus that we know as a city? Tyre. Okay, do we know anything about Tyre? Has there been any famous kings from Tyre? How about Hiram? You remember Hiram? Yeah, he was from Tyre. He was a great king. And I mean, I know that one of my best friends when I was in college at my fraternity, his name was Hiram. Hiram Hogg, and uh, that was my best bud. But this Tyre or Tyrus 
for some reason, God is saying, take up a lamentation for them. So Ezekiel, I want you to speak this out. Now Tyre kind of had another smaller city that would go hand in hand by the name of Zidon that was near Tyre. And Ty Zidon had a king one time who had a daughter that became very famous. Her name was Jezebel. And Jezebel introduced the Baal worship into Israel. Okay? So there's a lot of history here, a lot of stuff you can go down this road, but let's go back and look. So who is the king of Tyre at this point in time? Do we know? Well, through some of the historical works, the books, I found out that the king probably is a gentleman by the name of Ethbaal, E-T-H-B-A-A-L, or also known as Ithabalus, I-T-H-O-B-A-L-U-S, because that's who was king when they were destroyed. And that's what we're talking about right here, what's getting ready to happen. So possibly it's a person by this name, Ithbaal, is the king that's in reference to right here. Well, it says, I want you to talk to him or, or do this song of lamentation for him because he's getting ready to come down. Well, Tyre was the leading city of the Phoenicians. It was perfect in where it was positioned along trade routes, which were accessible by water or by land. So there was tremendous trade going through Tyre. And with a lot of trade comes a lot of wealth. So they were very well blessed. And this, this king, uh, he says, and if we come on down, he said, uh, thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Describing this king, sealest up the sum. Now that's an interesting statement. You know, according to the quarterly here, it said that's where we get our seal of approval from. Maybe because kings had a seal, you know, a signet, maybe their ring or whatever, that when they did it, that meant they did it and they sealed it and it was a decree. But according to uh, Matthew Henry, he's thinking what this is actually saying is that he was perfect in everything that he needed. He had beauty, he had wealth, and he had wisdom. There was nothing more to be added to what he had. He had it all, in other words, this king. God had blessed him immensely. Now, the old adage about the old rich man that had all this money said, how much more do you need? Just a little bit more. Never satisfied. Just a little bit more, a little bit more. And you see that all throughout history. People just killing themselves, chasing the almighty dollar. <clears throat> There's nothing wrong with having money. It's when that money becomes the object of your love and devotion, that's when you start having problems. I think something is equally bad is when the Lord blesses you, you start thinking it's because of something you've done, and then you know you start elevating yourself up to it. Or you don't use it to help people? Well, yeah, that too. A lot of problems. Yeah. What about the guy that had so much, he tore everything down, built bigger barns? Yeah. What happened to him? He died. You know, didn't get to enjoy it. Well, here, you know, this he has sealed up the sum. So depending on however you want to look at that, I kind of like Matthew Henry's, that he had everything he needed. Because you come down after that, he said he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Well, now you can say, well, they're talking about the city of Tyre. Maybe. Because there's not a lot of explanation. This is a very strange passage. But I kind of think it was him, because we're going to see some of the stuff that goes on. He was the leader of Tyre. And everything rises and falls on the leadership of that, you know, whoever's in charge. They're the ones responsible. So Tyre was positioned perfectly where the trade took, you know, came through and they were amassing a lot of wealth and everything was just going fine. Well, Tyre's ruler needed to be full of wisdom to be able to lead his kingdom. And Ezekiel affirmed that God had given him this wisdom. He had wisdom. He also had beauty, whether, you know, they were describing him or the city, whatever, but there was a lot of beauty. It was perfect beauty. He'd been blessed. So <clears throat> this is who 
this message is being directed towards is this Ethbaal or Ethbaalus, the king of Tyre. All right, verses 13 through 15. We're going to talk about what all he had. <coughs> Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And then he lists all these stones, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and gold. Now those stones also played an important part in Israel's history. They were the stones that were on the ephod of the high priest. Okay? The high priest's position was as a protector of Israel. He was supposed to be the religious leader, the instructor. Well, here, this king of Tyre, he was also covered in all these stones. Now, right now, there's nothing wrong with this. He's not trying to usurp the authority. Uh, now, was, was Tyre part of Israel? Were they Jewish? No. They were near Israel, so they probably knew about Israel's God, but they weren't, okay? But here, for some reason, he's looking at this king and he's likening him to a lot of stuff that's going on in Israel, which is very interesting. Then it says, The workmanship of thy tabrets and thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. All right, now, <clears throat> you can look at that saying, when he, in the day that thou was created, possibly was it when he was born, or maybe it was his coronation day to be king. Tabrets and pipes are musical instruments. And there was some very, you can really start getting into some interesting things here with Matthew Henry in, in the, uh, the pronouns that were used and masculine, feminine, so on and so forth. They start going down all this stuff. We're not going to do that here. But these instruments were very curious. They produced a very interesting, different sound. And according to what he thinks is that this music was played constantly throughout his palace. And that people would come in and he was listening to this music, you know. And at first it was it was just all perfect perfection. And then I think as we start going down towards the end of this section right here, is when start sin starts coming in. And Bob nailed it. It was pride. Who invented pride? Lucifer. He's the first one that, you know, we show where pride came around. You know, he wanted to be worshipped just like God. He thought he was so pretty. And he was. He was beautiful. You know, he was an angel of light. He was the most beautiful. And I think the pride went to him. And we're going to see some references here that there's two different schools of thought. As we start looking, it's being some people thrown down. It could be Satan and his angels being thrown out of heaven. Or it also could be a reference to Adam and Eve being taken out of the Garden of Eden. You can argue either way here. So, whichever, doesn't matter. We're going to look at more or less what this is trying to point out, what's going on here. So, uh, Ezekiel used three descriptions of Tyre's king that are basically difficult to interpret. First, Ezekiel described him as the anointed cherub. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. What's a cherub? It is a winged celestial being whose primary function is to guard and protect. Amen. <laughs> we saw cherubs a lot of places in the Holy of Holies and the artwork and things like this and in different places over the ark and things. But the main thing is to protect, I think is the point that we want to take from this. It was a protector and it was designated by God to be a protector of something. Who, what happened when Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden? That's an angel. That's what did that angel have? <laughs> yeah, they ain't getting back in. He was protecting the Garden of Eden. Why could they not go back into the Garden of Eden? Because the Garden of Eden was perfect. Yeah. But what could they have done if they'd gone back in there? Why did they have to get out? They could eat the tree of life and live forever in their sin. Exactly. Exactly. So they had to go back. They had to get out. 
they, they, they couldn't do that. That's just not the way it's going to work out. Well, here it describes, thou art the anointed chair. Who is? This king of Tyre is what God's telling Ezekiel to say. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Well, you think of the holy mountain of God or the city of God being Jerusalem. We're not talking about Jerusalem. We're talking about Tyre. Now, Tyre was on a rock. But here, he's talking about you were this anointed cherub. So I believe what, if we kind of look at this kind of in a logical standpoint of what it's saying, is that Ethabel was sent there by God for a reason, and he was to be a protector of this beautiful place and of these people. Maybe because they were near Israel to learn about God and become followers of God. But he was blessed. He had wisdom beyond measure. He had beauty beyond measure. And he had wealth beyond measure. He had everything that he could possibly need to be a great, successful ruler. And God was blessed him with that. Where do we get our wisdom? You know, I, I look at some people just are so smart and they're just born that way. Well, that, that's from God. Others of us, we have to study and, and really try to figure things out and sometimes learn the hard way by doing stupid stuff. But hopefully you're writing a book and you have a chapter entitled Things I Never Want to Do Again and you put those stupid things in there. Sometimes we don't. We repeat them. But here, he's, he's basically calling him a cherub or a protector. I have set thee, reminded King's Tyre, that whether he recognized God or not, God was the source of his blessing. That's so true today. Whether people recognize it or not, their blessing is as a result of God. Okay? Number two. Ezekiel told the king of Tyre, Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Well, <clears throat> interpreters have, adjusted, have suggested it refers to Tyre, which sat on a raised rock structure. Okay, maybe. But <clears throat> this is God's classification <clears throat> of it. Then third, Ezekiel affirmed of the king, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. The stones of fire, probably, now going back more of Matthew Henry, are these dazzling stones that he had as he's covering, he wore on his clothes. I think they were also implanted in the rooms all throughout this palace, maybe even in the floor. So whenever he walked, he was in the midst of all of these beautiful, precious stones that had great, great value. Some have interpreted that he was like he was walking in the presence of angels. So, this guy had it all. He had it all. And it's giving the references here of all the stuff. He walked up and down in the midst of the fire, stones of fire. So he had all these stones that he wore, of these beautiful stones that were put into his clothing. They were implanted into his walls and maybe his floors of his palace. And everything was just perfect. Well, it says... The day that thou was created, again, stresses God's special creation of Tyre's king for his, God's, sovereign purposes. All right? And it says, thou was perfect in thy ways. Well, <clears throat> we got to be careful with that word perfect. Who was perfect? Yeah. No man. Not even Abraham was perfect. And it kind of says the word translated perfect does not mean perfection. Rather, it denotes a consistent life of integrity. Now, I like that. A consistent life of integrity. That's something that's very important to me is that in my business that I'm looked at, that I'm a man of integrity, that I'm honest, that I'm truthful. And I want that because if something, somebody comes up and says I did something dishonest and that just goes all through me and I want to combat that. Sometimes you... You can't, you know, prove a negative, you know. So here he's talking about that he was consistent in his life of integrity to a certain point. And then something changed. We come down to the last part. Thou wast perfect 
in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. What happened? This reminds me of, of Satan being cast out of, of heaven, mm -hmm. especially when you look down in verse 17, which we haven't gotten to yet, which says, I cast you to the ground. And as a cherub, you were an anointed guardian cherub. It makes me wonder if this was a physical king or if this was the force behind that's the king, another. To be yep. honest. That's another reference. That's a, it's an interpretation. Mm -hmm. And it's well, and, and when you look at it, it, you know, we look at the principle of key repeated phrases. Mm -hmm. And a key repeated repeated phrase is on the day that you were created. On the day that you were created. Well, cherubim, celestial beings, angelic beings are created beings. Mm -hmm. When God's talking about man, he talks about on the day you were born, on the day you were knit together. Here he says over and over on the day you were created. Right. And when you look at Eden, who was in Eden? There were only what? Adam, Eve, God, the serpent in Eden. And then it was closed. Nobody else could ever go in there. Right. So I agree, and there's biblical precedent in Daniel that there are angelic beings, the king of Persia, battling in the heavenlies, angelic forces behind earthly rulers. Right. He's already dealt with the earthly leader of Tyre in the first 11 verses, and now, I, I, and, and we all may have to agree to disagree, but now I think he's addressing the, the demonic force behind the leader. No, this is good because... If everybody thinks just alike all the time, you never go anywhere, okay? That's why I'm throwing out different ideas. You pick out what you want. So you're right. Now, you said something. Can, there's all of these angels, these spiritual beings that are around. So if they're around, the converse of that is there's also demonic forces all around. Absolutely. Now, let me throw out something that's kind of going to blow your mind and just... I would tell you for, for thinking. I read an article just the other day that NASA was looking for spiritual leaders to help bridge the gap of when aliens are introduced to humanity. Did anybody see this article? <laughs> NASA is looking for spiritual leaders that can help introduce these aliens to humanity well <laughs> let's carry that on down the road as this article went on what if these aliens are demonic forces that's an interesting thought is it not well what's going to happen in the end times there's going to be a battle in there between good and bad, mm -hmm. God and Satan. I, I don't know. I, I just, I love reading stuff and then trying to think and think, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but whenever I do that, then later on down, it's like, no, it wasn't. Now, I don't know. It's just stuff because I love science, technology, and I love prophecy. So, explain how they're supposed to look back in six months through this web telescope that they just launched and see the creation of yep. Earth. I, I, that to me is incomprehensible. I don't know. I, I know, Bob. And uh, there is, you think about smart people that use a lot more of their brain, you know, Einstein, stuff like this, that can vision these things. They're visionaries, they can see how to make these things work. Well, that all came from God, did it not? That's why I was going. But some people are just created smart. Others, well, we're not so smart. We have to struggle with it. But going back here to the lesson, which we get off, and that's my fault, but I thought it was interesting to say that. Iniquity was found in thee. That's the verse that right there kind of tells it all. One of the things, a person's true character will reveal itself in time. It will. Their true character will reveal itself in time. Or another way of saying that, give a man enough rope, he'll hang himself. 
Absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've heard them all. There's all kinds of them out there. But I think that the more power and wealth that a person is given, the greater the temptation. So you got to be very careful. I think if we start off with giving back to God and helping people, God's going to continue to bless us. Then we can help more and give back to God more. And it's a principle that God tries to instill with a little bit. And we saw different things where you were faithful over a little, then I'll give you more. And we keep doing this. And, you know, God can really do a lot through a person who has the gift of giving. But you've got to also be careful that you don't take and say, wait a minute, man, this is a whole bunch of stuff. Why am I giving all this away? Then that's when you can start getting into trouble. And I think that's what's going on here with this situation. If you go with that this was a man, but even if you go with that it's a it's a, a spirit or a force or just an attitude, it's all bad. The apostle Paul, Paul warned against appointing church leaders too quickly. Rather, you know, they should prove themselves for a time. Now, when I first got saved in a little free will Baptist church in Catlettsburg, Kentucky. It's just a little small country church. They came to me uh, shortly after and they wanted me to be a deacon. Now they didn't have deacon rotation. You were a deacon until you died or you uh, quit or whatever. But before I could be voted on, they called, they were gonna set me aside for one year and they, watched my lifestyle and okay and that's what they did and I thought that was a pretty good indicator that's a good way to do things I thought it really was I didn't agree with being a deacon forever you know because that's there again absolute power you know and I saw some of that but <clears throat> after that one year then I was brought before a board within the um, free will Baptist church and was questioned uh, for I don't know our student on my beliefs and all this stuff. But I think that's what, you know, Paul was talking about is that when you take somebody that really, really looks good, boom, let's put them in there, let them do this, let them do that. You got to be careful because that can ruin somebody. They can't handle that much notoriety, power, whatever, pride. And this whole lesson kind of comes back into pride. And as we start looking, Randy got into it a little bit there in verse 17, but let's go back to verse 16 here and we'll get down there. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Merchandise, there's the trade factor. All the trade, all the money coming in. Well, where there's a lot of money, there tends to be a lot of corruption. Okay? And thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, O protector, from the midst of the stones of fire. You're not doing your job. You're not doing what you were supposed to do. Now, going along with this school of thought over here that Paul had, this can apply to anything where the spirit comes in to corrupt, and God can say... I'm done with that. They're gonna, we're going to take you out. You're not, you're not doing what you were supposed to do. And that has happened all throughout history where somebody was put in a position to do a certain thing. God blessed them in that, and then they failed. Typically, that's what would happen because man is so susceptible to corruption, to greed, to pride, to whatever. Now, we can go back and blame it on Eve. I think you need to more or less blame it on Adam because Adam should have been the man of the house and said, no, Eve, we're not going to do that because he was standing right there with her because she took and then turned and gave him some. Okay. You know? So, but here, <clears throat> all of us have a sin nature. You're born with a sin nature. You don't have to be taught how to sin. That comes natural. And that's what's interesting when you read verse 15 because it says you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. Well, that's no man. Yeah, no. For all of sin to fall short of the glory of but God. But that perfection, I think, 
talked you know about the integrity, but no, you're right. And depend on how you go with that. Now, was Lucifer perfect when he was created? Until unrighteousness was found yeah. in him, until his pride lifted him up to where he wanted to be. But then, pride. was that gene or that what, whatever you want to call it, was it hidden in there? This could, this is where the big debate comes. Who created Lucifer? Okay, so why did God create Lucifer knowing God being omniscient that he was going to do this? It's the reason he created us. I mean, he gave us free will. And we well, he loves free. us. Yeah. Uh, these are some really, really heavy topics to sit here and dwell on. And that's the reason I'm throwing them out there. You maybe never thought about something like this. But think, hmm. That would get you in the Bible study and to try to figure out what's going on here. And there's always little scriptures, nuggets hidden, that if you go look, you can dig them out. But and it's just like when you look at Job. I mean, we, you know, when you look at God's final response, were you there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, or, or, or Isaiah, will the clay say to the potter, why have you done? God's God. That's right. And he does as he pleases. He creates as he pleases. He moves as he pleases. He's God. And I believe that that's why he introduces in Genesis 1-1 the very first name of himself is that he's creator, so he gets to make the rules. That's right. Um, he can create whomever and whatever he chooses right. for his pleasure. And we can't understand it in our humanness, but faith is taking God at his word. And right. God said it is thus then to believe otherwise is to question God. Right, and you said the word faith. That's the whole thing God wants us to exercise, is faith. Where did God come from? He's Jehovah, the self-existent one. He depends on nothing or no one for his existence. He's eternal. But see, we're creatures of time. We have to have a start and an end. Well, that's us. Not the right. <laughs> that's, that's right, yeah. That's <laughs> exactly. It's a big problem. That's problem. It's a big problem. But, yeah. you know, how long is eternity? You want to get a headache, try to figure that one out. It's like the wedding ring. It's, it's no start, no beginning. It's endless. But, going back, by the multitude of thy merchandise have they filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou sin. Therefore will I cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and will destroy thee. O covering cherub, your protector, taking you out of your greatness. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. By reason of thy brightness, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. So, <clears throat> whether it be a literal king or whether it be a, uh, a concept or a presence or the city or whatever, they're going down. Now, you got to realize that all of the trading partners, all of the nations around have looked at this city and thought, they're, they're perfect. That's who I aspire to be like. That's the greatest. And God's going to take it down. Nobody's going to believe it. Now, if this was an individual, they were to bring glory to God, to acknowledge God was the one that gave them all of this that didn't do that or you know it's God says I'm going to get the glory I want people to see who I really am so he's going to destroy them now what happens when somebody's being punished by God God's people being punished and other people pile on and make fun and mock and carry on they're in jeopardy they're in trouble God doesn't take too kindly to that. A lot of the nations did that. Well, we're running out of time here. Uh, 1819. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the man multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that beheld thee. Basically, they're going to be destroyed from within. You know, you think about a fire being an invading enemy coming in and setting fire, but it says from the midst of thee, it's going to come from 
internal strife within the city, within this nation of Tyre. That's where it's going to come. They're going to, they're going to cause their own self to fall. As we look throughout history, all great empires typically fall from within. They get so strong and nobody can come in. So they have to fall because of the corruption. They fall from within, whether it's bickering and fighting amongst themselves or whatever. We see churches, which is so sad. They'll split because of bickering and fighting within. There's that spirit that we're talking about. And then when all the people see what's happening, they're just going to not be able to believe it. And then it goes on. It talks about some more things going on in between. We go to the next and talk about a, a prickling briar or a thorn that's constantly agitating God's people, which we can say as a, as a church. Has the church ever been truly at rest without any conflict or any outside interference trying to attack them? There's always been this prickling thorn or briar that's just, but when we all get to the ultimate Canaan, then it's gone. Now, we got to be careful what's going on with Christianity and the onslaught against it. If we're coming down to the end times, the battle of good and evil, there's going to be an onslaught against the church like you've never seen. We're starting to see some of it. You go back to, remember the name Lois Lerner? Does that name ring a bell? Mm -hmm. IRS. Yeah, IRS. She went after churches. It started. Who was she under? Obama. Yeah. As Monkey Works called him, the Kenyan. <laughs> but folks, we need to be, as Don started off the lesson with, a beacon on a hill, a shining light out to the world. We've got to be standing firm. We've got to be resolute in what we believe. And we've got to not cower. <clears throat> now, we're not going to go out there and be insurrectionists and start all a mess and, and be very uh, disruptive in trying to fight. But we need to do battle with love. And I still think there's going to be a great revival hit before the end. And that's going to be exciting. But God says, I'm going to gather my people back who were carried off by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, and even by some little smaller nations around them came in and carried them off. God said, I'm going to bring them back. And I'm going to put them back in this land that I gave to their forefathers. They're going to build houses. And they're going to plant vineyards. In other words, they're going to be here for a while. Israel never was perfect. Neither are we. But the key about this lesson is pride and not acknowledging God for who God is. We need to make sure we do that in our lives today. That we acknowledge that everything we have, whether it be material things, knowledge, good looks, whatever, <laughs> it comes from God. Okay, let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for another day. We, we thank you for this lesson. I pray, Lord, that you will help us have a hunger to get into your word, to study, to learn, to seek answers from you, to draw closer to you, that we can discuss things about you and, and have our eyes open to who you are and what you want us to do. Speak to us, Father, through the scriptures, through our pastor. And with that, we also now ask that you bless Brother Mark in the next hour as he brings the message. And we give you praise for it all in Jesus' name. And amen. amen. Right.